poison happen and um, uh, um, it's quite a, uh, uh, quite a wonderful event and I'm glad to see uh, everybody here. So uh, it, it's very common to um, uh, stress the, the depth and breadth of the resources that uh, we have for the study of the Congo um, uh, in uh, earlier centuries. Um, so we have the copious ethnographies from the turn of the 20th century, uh, as well as well of written uh, material um, from the uh, 16th century on. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to that, specifically, the Kingdom of Congo has been uh, studied from the perspective of two sets of sources. Uh, mostly on the one hand, the, the, the written document, the correspondence, and diplomatic um, um, uh, documentations and then the missionary commercial, uh, commercial reports uh, that were available. And on the other hand, uh, uh, specifically for the material and visual culture, um, the ethnography, uh, ethnographic reports, ethnographies recorded in the 20th century have been uh, tremendously useful in um, uh, deciphering some of this material. Um, in my own work, I'm trying to step aside from these uh, uh, methodologies and try to uh, um, use another angle to contribute to our understanding of the Congo from the historically grounded perspective that an analysis of the visual and material culture from uh, that early modern period uh, can afford us. Um, and, and indeed, there's quite a range of objects and documents that helps us uh, do this. And, uh, with new excavation, an increasing uh, range of objects and documents. Um, but, but there's already a, a, a quite a few that uh, really uh, allows us to, uh, uh, to look at this, uh, at this history. And some of it is well known, some of it is little known, uh, and other, uh, other documents are not, uh, have not been studied. Um, but what I want to do today uh, in this short time is to look at two particular examples from the 17th century. Um, that can help us uh, demonstrate how these visual and material sources considered from the methodological perspective of art history uh, can uh, allow for uh, uh, that kind of historically grounded study of the kingdom as well as its participation in the broader um, uh, religious, commercial and political networks of the Atlantic world which was the uh, larger uh, um, background in which the kingdom of Congo operated. Uh, uh, from the uh, 16th to the, um, the 18th century. Um, and, yes. So the first uh, set of objects I, I, I would like to consider are this uh, series of oral studies that were painted by Albert Eckhout, um, who was the court painter from the governor of Dutch Brazil, uh, Johan Mauritz. Um, and uh, these were painted around 1652, and they see the likeness of um, five ambassadors uh, that were sent from the Congo to, uh, to Brazil. Um, and there were probably six uh, of these vignettes at some point, but one of them has been uh, lost. Um, the three senior ambassadors at the top were probably uh, uh, Miguel de Castro, Bastian de Sonio, and Antonio Fernandes, um, who Dutch traveler and chronicler uh, Johann Neuhoff described as members of the educated Congo elite who could converse with the Dutch officials in Latin. And interestingly, uh, one of the goals of their mission was to secure uh, a new regalia to bring back to the Congo, uh, such as, and I quote, a, a chair, a cape, war insignia, flags, and other items of clothing. Um, what's interesting is that these paintings do not stage uh, uh, this Congo ambassador in, in any kind of elaborate composition, but rather are, are following very much a, a, a documentary mode. Um, so what we have uh, are uh, first the three um, high-ranking men who wear the uh, colorf colorful mpoo caps uh, on their head, uh, which are adorned with uh, uh, shells, as well as um, uh, they have metal chains, medals, and crosses, and long strings of coral beads um, uh, around the neck. And um, these shiny oil paintings are very difficult to photograph, so um, uh, you'll have to uh, trust me on some of the details. Um, two of the three men have draped uh, extravagant length of heavy dark wools over their bare shoulders uh, uh, here and here. 
um, and they've combined it with wrappers of the same fabric or sometimes a mix of Central African dark dyed pattern cloth. Um, so uh, here, this gentleman here is wearing a dark wool uh, wrapper, uh, but he there, and you'll have to believe me, is wearing um, a Central African um, dyed uh, pattern cloth. Um, the third ambassador uh, uh, right here um, is um, dressed in a lighter fashion. It has a, this yellow brocade uh, wrapper that is shorter, and it's also not wearing the coat, um, but uh, uh, it's a um, uh, pool and a uh, uh, medal and jewels, uh, uh, making very much a, as uh, fancy as the other two. And I believe he's dressed uh, um, in order to dance the uh, martial exercises uh, of Sangamanto that was um, typical uh, of uh, the Congo and that we know this stage for uh, Johan Mauritz uh, when they were, uh, they were there and that's also why he's, wearing, he's uh, holding his bow and arrow as uh, one of the props that he will be uh, use, using in the dance. Um, all three legates too uh, have around their waist this red belt uh, that we have seen on the uh, on that marble bust uh, a minute ago, also uh, as well as uh, animal pelts uh, folded on their waist there quite neatly, and then uh, holding it all together with this uh, checkered blue cloth. Um, and you can see it here and a little bit here too. Uh, that's uh, visibly an imported uh, an imported piece of te textile. Um, their bareheaded attendants, uh, uh, on the other hand, wrapped on their shoulders uh, some net like uh, textiles that really resemble the shoulder nets of status uh, that we know very well uh, from documents, uh, visual and written, as well as more um, modern uses. Um, and um, this is what you can see here, and uh, he's all holding something uh, similar in his hand um, there. Uh, they also wear simpler wrappers uh, of Congo cloth adorned with loosely hanging rather than neatly folded animal skins. Uh, so here, this is the animal skin here and another one there. And you can see very specifically the raffia cloth um, uh, of this wrapper there. So as these, image, as these images suggest, the defining trait <coughs> of Congo Christian regalia in the early modern period of the kingdom um, revolved around artful juxtaposition of local and foreign elements combined and redefined into a new look. As early as 1491, Portuguese travelers noted how the King of Congo wore a combination of local and imported textiles um, to form an impressive outfit. Um, and the kingdoms of upper class soon followed uh, after uh, their ruler. Um, and indeed, looking at the documents, we have a consistent image of the Congo Christian elite regalia that appears across time. Um, and uh, on the screen, we have an uh, uh, engraving accompanying uh, Duarte Lopez, a Portuguese uh, traveler's um, description of the kingdom that was published in 1591. Um, Albert Eckhout's uh, 1642 paintings there, and then a mid 18th century uh, capuchin watercolor, in which you have uh, the, same, um, the same kinds of uh, 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 pieces of clothing and combination of them uh, uh, coming together. Um, and uh, these European depictions also closely correspond to the findings of uh, um, the most important, uh, until last summer, archaeological exploration of the Congo Kingdom uh, that uh, Pierre uh, mentioned of at Ngongo Vata was conducted in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and uh, in the elite burial ground uh, of a church uh, dated uh, to the uh, 18th century. And what's uh, striking was the rich uh, men and interred at the site were luxuriously clothed, adorned, and outfitted with just this kind of uh, precious local and exotic items. Um, the excavation file records finding of fine textiles, some woven with gilt thread, iron and silver shirts, uh, beads, chains of, of brass, gold, and silver, uh, Christian medals and crucifixes of various precious metals as well as glassware and ceramics, um, all either locally made or imported from uh, Europe or beyond. And in this case, um, there was a chart, some charts um, from, of pottery, um, porcelain from, uh, from China. Um, and it will be great to see uh, what the uh, uh, excavation from Congo can uh, yield, but I expect much of the same. Um, 
So in any case, these images and the practices they depict capture how the Congo Christian elite creatively mixed and seamlessly merged local and once foreign elements and transfigured them into the new regalia and pageantry of Congo Christianity. The sartorial practices and political <coughs> insignia we observe here function in this regard as spaces of inward-looking reflection through which the high-ranking men and women of the Congo embraced and recast the novelties brought to their shores by their participation in the early modern Atlantic world. They redeployed local and foreign, old and new ideas and forms into the newly interrelated parts of the evolving worldview of Congo Christianity. Um, the second example um, uh, uh, that I want to consider um, uh, is, is this um, pool cap of status. Um, so the combination of local and foreign elements articulated in the entire outfits also unfolded in the Mpu caps that served as emblems of status in the Congo. The caps are among the best documented objects of early modern Central African material culture uh, through written and visual description that we saw a little bit, as well as examples that arrived uh, in Europe uh, uh, as early as the 17th century. Um, their construction method is, is quite idiosyncratic. It's not weaving, it's not crochet, or um, it's uh, a, a spiraling, uh, um, a spiral of loops that go from top to bottom and construct this uh, textile uh, cone. Um, here, what we have uh, uh, is uh, small loops give a plain background, and then more elaborate loops. Uh, rise up from the surface and uh, uh, allow to uh, execute some uh, low and high relief uh, uh, motif. Um, um, so th this orthogonal design that I found, found in the cap, in particular in the main part here, is something that we find uh, over and over again. So in the uh, pottery uh, and also other uh, prestige items that uh, entered European collection early. Uh, so these two ivories uh, uh, there. Uh, that came to the Medici collection uh, in the 16th century, or of this textile here uh, that entered uh, um, uh, the uh, European collection in the early 18th century also. Um, so the male artists who crafted this particular mpu used the knots and loops technique to create an unusual object, one among a, hand, among a handful that peculiar design variations set apart from the rest of the known corpus. Um, the hat, now in Copenhagen's National Museum, arrived in Europe before 1674. Um, and so what we have here is that, that plain spiral at the top that echoes the band at the bottom. Um, and in the main vertical part, uh, this uh, geometric motif um, uh, typical of the Congo, and then triangular <coughs> shapes uh, at the top of the band and the bottom of the band that kind of echo each other. Um, but in sharp contrast to this uh, 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 flatter decoration, you have this uh, uh, five crosses around uh, the perimeter of the, uh, of the cap that are made with higher knots and that are different from uh, the rest of the design in almost uh, all aspects. They're finite, uh, they're uh, raised up, and they're free floating, whereas everything else uh, uh, is um, uh, brought together. Um, and the surface, the geometric surface design are really difficult to interpret, but the cross, I think, at least, can be partly uh, deciphered. Um, in 1696, um, the Capuchin Matalino Datri saw a um, mpu similar to this one in the coronation of the King of Congo, Pedro IV. Coming to power in the midst of a civil war, the new king ascended to a much weakened Congo throne in a modest ceremony conducted on the site of the then abandoned capital of uh, San Salvador and Bonsa Congo. Unable to use the European style crown, his predecessors lost to the Portuguese in the disastrous Inquila Battle of 1665. Pedro was coronated instead with a mpun on which featured the royal coat of arms of the Congo, described by Datri as five unsheathed thirds of shiny silver hue embroidered or pinned on the cap. The locally crafted hat replaced the gold-plated silver crown that the Pope had offered to the Congo kings, a once sparring object that had become central to the regalia of the Christian Central African monarch. The, the substitution of the cap for the crown 
relied on the Congo Christian correlation of local and foreign conceptions and manifestations of power and prestige. It concurrently drew from the intrinsic symbolic value of the Mpu as a Central African insignia of rulership and from the significance of the Congo coat of arms as a potent emblem of royal power. Serbs formed the central motif of the escutcheon, but the early Christian king uh, adopted circa 1500. Um, when they evoked through heraldry the story of the triumph of Catholicism in the Congo. And since then, the Congo rulers used this uh, as seal uh, um, in their uh, regalia, banners, symbols of office. Uh, and just to show you one example, a 1581 seal on a letter uh, from King uh, Alvaro of Congo. And you can uh, probably not see the five servants here. One, one, two. Uh, forming the escutcheon. So that's something that they kept uh, using. So with the addition of the heraldic signs, uh, Pedro's Mpu became an insignia of Christian kingship. The third on the surface of the cap functioned as other objects often attached to or designed on Central African Mpu caps. Claws, fangs, snakes, or feathers, metaphorically linking rulers with the superhuman skills of mighty or mythical animals. Here, animal claws enhance the <coughs> um, from uh, the uh, 18th century. And you see them at the top. In a similar form of metonymy, the surge on Pedro's Mpu linked its word to the supernatural powers of Saint Jim and his providential army of knights, whose miraculous apparition in a crucial battle at the moment of the early years of the Christian Congo enabled and sanctioned the rule of his Christian predecessor. The European derived heraldic signs uh, uh, there become a uh, Congo strops. In other words, in Pedro's Mpu, the imagery of the coat of arms functioned not only as a Portuguese inspired emblem, but also as a full fledged Congo metaphor and eventually expressed conception of regal power that mixed, merged, and transfigured both sides. Pedro invoked in his cap the story of the miraculous advent of Christianity under the Congo's first great Catholic king in a multivalent effort to legitimate his own claim to the throne and position himself in the lineage of a Congo Christian monarch. And this episode allows us to understand how the political and symbolic changes that unfolded along the period did not adhere to a teleological pattern of acculturation or appropriation. The kings of Congo did not adopt the gilded European crown or the items of regalia to emulate European rulers. And neither were the foreign objects fully taken over by local worldviews. Rather, they took part in a sophisticated reflection about the nature of power and legitimacy in the Congo in the face of altered religious and material circumstances. That a gilded crown will replace a mpu, and a mpu equally serving place of a gilded crown, showcases well the contingent, strategic, iterative, and cumulative path that Congo Christianity followed from its advent circa 1500 and through centuries of dense history. And I believe the cross on this mpu functions in a similar manner as the coronation cap. It combines low relief motif typical of Congo textile with crosses in, in high relief. Um, that are distinct from the main patterns. Um, and the symbol on the Mpu, uh, these crosses clearly associated the cap with the combination of Christian and Central African notions of life, death, and immanence, central to Congo Christianity and, and expressed in general with the sign of the cross. Yet the signs also functioned as the surs on Pedro's hat or the claws on the other example. That is to say, as emblems qualifying the nature and origin of their wearer's prestige. In this case, their distinct hollow branches linked its noble wearer to the order of Christ. Um, and uh, we have uh, 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 many other examples from the period. Here, a uh, uh, late 16th century uh, depiction of the King of Congo wearing the cross on his chest. Uh, here, 1750, uh, the, um, the embroidery of the um, Order of Christ cross on the coat, and the medallion from uh, the Ngongo Mbata um, again. So attached to the caps as lion claws, embroidered snakes, or other badges of prestige, the crosses turned the Mpu into an emblem of Christian nobility, 
While they also became, on the Yompu, Central African metaphors of the power and legitimacy that the caps were derived from invisible realms. Here again, in successive and cumulative strokes, ideas and motifs linked to both Congo and European religious and political thoughts met, blurred, and eventually redeployed into a single cohesive object. In conclusion, more than a combination of heteroclite pieces, Congo Christian regalia formed a cohesive whole in which the symbols of prestige borrowed from Europe as well as Christianity altogether, entered in a complex and evolving dialogue with pre-existing visual expressions of might and prestige and their concomitant mythological and religious space. The Congo elite combined in cumulative and interlacing streams objects and ideas that express their status as Christian nobles and participants in the Atlantic world while making sense of these changes according to their own worldview. Considering visual and material culture, in this case regalia, helps us understand the sophisticated conversation that unfolded between the Congo religious, political, and historical thoughts, and the novelties brought to their shores by an expanding world. Thank you.